Well, hello, that's me again, but it's not just about me, it's about my wonderful guest with whom a uh, last conversation uh, created and generated a lot of interest and rightly so, a wonderful uh, Dr. Lama, Fadi Lama. And this is the second in uh, our conversations. And I want to start with, obviously, I want to give the stage to Dr. Lama. But before I do it, I want to uh, make sure that you understand that uh, what Dr. Lama is doing here, pretty much the same what I usually do. It's to give the framework before we go in the issues of the practical geopolitics, probably next conversation. Maybe we will uh, catch up a little bit on that today. But I want to introduce today that this wonderful news, wonderful being, of course, in uh, quotation marks, well, Mr. Jeffrey Payad, the guy with degree in international relations who runs the energy sector and state department who promised to kill uh, Russia's gigantic liquid, uh, liquefied natural gas on uh, Project Novatech uh, by the company Novatech, Arctic LNG2. Well, uh, considering the fact that the United States loves to blow up pipes, uh, pipelines, and things of this nature, sure. But here is a little bit problem for Mr. Jeffrey Pyatt and those people who are already planning this. It is all in the north under very good cover by the northern uh, Russian Northern Fleet and the units which are associated on that. And Russia will react really, really badly, not just on the international pipeline as the Nord Stream 2 was. This is strictly Russian-owned, Russian-promoted, built and uh, operated project. And it is one of the major gigantic energy projects, which, of course, uh, creates a huge competition for the United States. And the United States doesn't love competition. So in having introduced this type of pain, I will leave the stage for Dr. Lama. And Dr. Lama, please go at it. OK. Last time we talked about, uh, we mentioned this curve, but I would like to go over it a little bit. Uh, this curve is, as you can see, is the data for 40 years, 1976 to 2016. It took all that was produced in, in terms of real goods in the world and all the energy consumed, okay? Uh, and uh, as you can see, the correlation, the R squared uh, regression, uh, linear uh, regression is 0 0.98, which is a very high number. What this means is that the equation, which you see Y is equal to 3.27 minus 18.3, this equation explains 98% of the variation in the data, okay? So what this says without any question is that uh, production of real goods is directly linked to the energy consumed. Okay, at the bottom, there's a simple example. Okay, this is, uh, first you have that to produce $1,000, and these are 1990 international Giri Hamis dollars, okay, constant dollars, uh, that you require about the energy equivalent of 300 kilograms of oil. Okay, to understand a little bit, when you are carrying, let's say, uh, one kilogram of steel or, or one pound of steel in your hand, actually you have the energy of one point equivalent of 1.5 uh kilograms or pounds of oil energy plastics a kilogram of plastics in your hand to become plastic it has taken two kilograms equivalent of oil energy and for aluminum it's seven kilograms so you see the direct link between energy and materials okay now so with this uh, realization we have a powerful tool to really evaluate different economies, okay? Now, let's look at this. We're looking here, uh, we took as a reference point the uh, fall of the Soviet Union in 1991 as a starting point. And we looked at uh, the, uh, the USA, uh, the G7 group of countries, China and the Russia, Iran, and China, which, as we will see later, 
are the core of the sovereignist nations resisting the empire, okay? So in 1991, the fall of the Soviet Union, the U.S. was about uh, double, uh, sorry, 50% more than the rate, and the combined G7 was uh, about three times more than uh, the RIC grouping, okay? More than uh, three times. So you could see how much more powerful economically the, the West was, if we call West and East, okay? Now, <clears throat> what happened is uh, the, uh, the growth of both the US, which is the biggest uh, economy in the West, flattened the growth was minimal in the 90s and effectively flattened around 2005 the peak was 2007 after which it started falling and the same applies for the black uh, dots uh, squares at the top now what we see we see the phenomenal growth of china after the year 2000 and that china the chinese economy uh, overtook the U.S. economy around the year 2011. That's when the yellow crosses the blue uh, triangles. And uh, the RIC overtook uh, the G7. Remember, RIC is China, Russia, and Iran, three countries. The G7 is the U.S., Canada, Japan, Germany, France, Italy, U.K., Okay, you have seven countries there. So the RIC, these three countries overtook the combined G7 in around 2017, okay? And by 2020, the Chinese economy exceeded the total of G7. Okay, another interesting thing we can get out of this curve is that after 2007, there was, a, there was effectively a reduction in the G7 economy, the shrinkage of about 6%. During this period, the population of G7 countries increased by 6%. So you have actually, an, if you wish, an impoverishment of society by about 12%. But when you realize that, uh, we will see this in a session on the neoliberal economy, but something which you already can feel, that there is a very poor distribution of wealth in the neoliberal economy. So for uh, the average, the loss in real income is more than 12%, okay? This can be felt, okay. Uh, May I add something, Dr. Lama? Yes, please, yes, please. Uh, what is interesting, and this is the data from the International Energy Agency, by which is actually run by the United States. But when you look at the top three producers, not consumers of energy, in the equivalent of the million uh, uh, tons of the oil equivalent, uh, actually Russia produces about 70% of the uh, energy produced by the United States. That's the thing which many people still cannot comprehend how it is. You know, they talk about Russian GDP. With GDP, of course, we know the fake numbers. And you are basically getting to the core of the matter by explaining that actually real energy is real economy, basically. That's what it comes down to. Exactly. And you need this for any geopolitical analysis because you need the real power, okay? <laughs> not the rubbish, you know, exaggerations. And I think we, uh, let me just uh, check one thing. Uh, I had a very nice curve. I want to, anyhow, let's uh, take a look at this here, the energy uh, sources. Okay. Uh, in 1973, I used it as a reference point because that's when the, uh, the Nixon shock and the petrodollar came in, etc. Whatever, oil was 50%. And it was the number one source of energy in the world. It still is the number one source of energy, although it's about uh, 31%. Coal is a very important source of energy also. Actually, uh, the Chinese phenomenal economic growth 
was based on coal. Until today, China, around 60% of its energy is derived from coal, okay? Definitely, this has a major catastrophe regarding pollution, which they are trying to address now by having, by having a lot of nuclear energy, okay? Anyhow, gas, nuclear, what's important is of the transportable energies, okay? Energy that you can transport. Okay, hydroelectric is definitely the cheapest and you should use it wherever uh, available, but you cannot have a river wherever you want, but you can have a nuclear power plant, fine. So the cheapest is the nuclear energy and it doesn't create any pollution and it provides you with a competitive advantage, okay? Realize the importance of energy in production. So when you have a cheaper source of energy, you have a competitive advantage, okay? Renewables are completely marginal, okay? Uh, they are uh, account for less than 6% of global energy needs, okay? And they are more expensive than nuclear or coal, and they are intermittent, unpredictable, and unreliable. So you cannot, you cannot uh, have a national uh, energy policy based on renewables. Fine, renewables, you can have them as standby, you can have them, you know, uh, as add-on or whatever, but you cannot base a national energy policy based on renewables. Okay, uh, we mentioned that nuclear energy being the cheapest transportable energy Okay, provides you with a competitive advantage. The interesting thing that there was a, effectively a nuclear energy monopoly. Okay, uh, the International uh, uh, Atomic Energy Agency says that they are available to help nations use peaceful energy. Okay, so in 50 years, none of the global south countries had nuclear energy. And whenever a country such as Iran tried to have nuclear energy, they prevented it for, for electrical purposes. Uh, the, note, note, uh, we can notice here the Comecon, okay, which are the East European countries, okay, they had uh, nuclear power plants supplied by the Soviet Union, okay, and the Global South, nothing until 1990. 2000, you started having uh, China, India, and Pakistan getting a bit active in the nuclear energy. This is the red, which you can see in 2020. Okay, the, the issue they say about nuclear energy is that most people or a lot of people would say that it's unsafe, or, okay, it's dangerous, you know, we don't want, and uh, actually they, uh, after the Fukushima accident, uh, many uh, countries went back on their energy, uh, nuclear energy policy. Uh, Japan shut down its nuclear power plants. Germany put in a policy to shut down its nuclear power plants, which they completed this year, whatever. So we have to look at the safety. Ah, we see that nuclear energy is safer than wind energy, okay? And much safer than uh, all the other hydropower, gas, that it's one of the safest energies, okay? This is the death rate per terawatt hour, okay, of energy produced. Hmm, a bit strange. Let's take a look at the Fukushima disaster. And there was a 9.1 magnitude earthquake which resulted in a 15 meter high tsunami, okay? The cooling system had emergency generators in the basement just five meters above sea level, okay? Japanese engineering. <laughs> yeah, but uh, no, 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 they're not. Gee, gee. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, gee. yeah. Imagine, they have it on the ocean, okay? And they have the emergency, emergency generator five meters above sea level. Of course, when the 15-meter tsunami came, the cooling system stopped. When the cooling system, uh, okay, the electricity power and the emergency could not start, so the cooling system stopped. 
This led to a heat up, okay? And it was actually a day later that you had a meltdown and then some radiation and then three units that were operational, okay? Now, so this was a really a very stupid elementary design where the guy probably took a design from somewhere, copy paste to another place without looking at the geography, okay? Or, or the conditions, anyhow. So, uh, the Fukushima disaster, one worker died seven years later from lung cancer as a result of radiation exposure. One guy died after seven years, okay? And there was no increased risk of cancer or other radiation-related health impacts, okay? So, in the table, we have some data about the different units, okay, and etc. We don't have to worry about them, but assuming, assuming that it was operating at 50% efficiency, okay? So, the number of terawatt hours produced would be this number, okay? So, this would amount to about 58,000 jobs created, sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry. 417, about a half a billion barrels of oil saved, and the actual death rate is 0 0.0000014, which is less than the one we had in the table we saw before, which is incredibly safe. Let's put these numbers in context. One death due to radiation exposure, okay, in the years since this started about for more than 40 years life in 2011 there were 4600 deaths due to traffic traffic deaths traffic accidents and 30000 suicide deaths so if you're concerned about safety of society etc then addressing suicide would be much more effective okay anyhow but but the Fukushima disaster had a very, very uh, important repercussions because as a consequence of uh, the Fukushima disaster, our friends, the Greens in Germany, were able for the first time to uh, win uh, in uh, regional elections and participate in the government. So, so it was a blessing for the Greens, okay? Okay. Now, uh, oil was 50% of the energy in 1973, and still today, it is the number one source of energy, okay? So, uh, it is interesting to, it's not interesting, it's very important to uh, study oil and oil pricing, okay? <clears throat> Here in the curve, we have uh, from 1965 till 2020, the old world oil consumption, okay, in billions of barrels. The interesting thing to notice is that around 1979, 1980, we have a valley, we have a drop. We have another drop around 2008 and another drop around uh, 2020, okay? Uh, what is the importance of this? This shows you the power of when you analyze economics, based on re real figures, on real data, not uh, bullshit things. Yeah. This shows you that there was a major economic contraction around 1979. The, the one around 2008, 2009, this is due to the financial crisis, which we are all aware of. And the last one, 2020, as a result of the uh, actions oh, taken yeah. uh, for COVID-19. But you can see reality the sensitivity of measuring energy to know what reality is happening, okay? It is very important for us to take a look and understand what happened in this big dip around 1979. Okay, sorry. Okay, these are the Federal Reserve fund rates, okay? During this period, 1979 to 1983, look at the interest rates, how high they shot, okay? 
Okay, later in, uh, in another session, we will discuss the importance of the federal fund rates. But basically, <coughs> the rating agencies, the rating agency Trinity, the RAT rating agency Trinity, uh, Mitch, uh, sorry, Fitch, Moody, Standard & Poor, okay, these rate the American sovereign debt as the highest, most, uh, best credit, okay? Everything else is high in the United States and countries abroad, okay? So we have to keep this in mind. So when the Fed increases the rates so much, it affects both the American market and the global uh, market. The impact on the global market was to destroy the manufacturing sector in the United States. Reaganomics coming in. Yeah, this destroyed the manufacturing sector. And this is, if you wish, like a coup d'etat where the financial sector took over the industrial sector. And uh, this is, if you want, the shift from capitalism to neoliberalism. And this was the tool by which this was achieved, okay? The other impact is that during the uh, 1970s, <clears throat> a, many, a lot of countries and uh, Latin American countries in particular, okay, but not only, were on a, uh, on a investing significantly in development. Okay, and they were encouraged to take that by uh, what John Perkins refers to as economic hitmen, EHM. When the interest rates shot like this, they could no longer pay, pay their uh, debts, service their debts. So they went bankrupt. Okay, they go bankrupt, their economies crash, and then the banks come uh, and uh, uh, IMF intervenes, imposes its conditions, okay, which basically is to open their uh, markets to, uh, to the foreign banks, and they were able to destroy, and it's referred to as the, uh, the lost decade of Latin America, okay? So, uh, fine. Now, so we understand the curve, we also understand what these dips mean and uh, what the real reasons for them are. Now let's look at oil price. <laughs> we can see that uh, more or less the curve is very smooth, okay, or at least comparably comparable to the, the, this curve and the oil price, you know. Uh, anyhow, so let's try and understand why the oil price varies. And this uh, what they teach us in university, that uh, pricing is a function of supply and demand. <laughs> this is what they teach the economists, okay? And that's why they end up not knowing much. And here we have the analysts coming to the picture. Okay, so they explain the, these uh, fluctuation, uh, drastic fluctuations in price by Yom Kippur War, Iranian Revolution, net back pricing introduced, Asian, etc. Okay, so these guys, they can always, uh, they provide uh, <laughs> reasons which obfuscate the real reasons for variations. Hopefully, with this uh, exercise we are doing, you'll be able to do your own analysis and not rely on these guys, okay? Let's try and analyze uh, the pricing because oil pricing, as you will see, is actually a very powerful geostrategic tool. Okay, oil pricing one. <clears throat> okay, we all know that the price shot in 1973. Okay, but more importantly, let's look at oil trade as a percent of other world trade, okay? The world trades, you say, by cars, cotton, textile, whatever, and oil. It was, in 1973, it was 10%. With the increase, it became 20% of the uh, of total uh, world trade, okay? And uh, then 
it increased further, reaching uh, 25 percent. <clears throat> Money was always gold, or money always had an intrinsic value, whether uh, gold or silver commonly, these were the two most common. Even the Bretton Woods Agreement, they had the dollar was actually 0 0.9 grams of gold, or $35 for an ounce of gold. And the US lost competitiveness, okay, because immediately after World War II, all the industrial countries, Western Europe, uh, the Soviet Union, Japan, their industry, their economies, everything was destroyed, okay? And the U.S. was reigning supreme. Then these countries started producing, okay, fine. And uh, the U.S. was spending a lot of money on wars, the Korean War, and on the plethora of bases all around the world, okay? So... It was having trade deficits and an er erosion of its gold reserves. And uh, Nixon ended the gold backing officially on August 15, 1971. Okay, fine. Now, what will sustain the dollar? The dollar was going in free fall. <clears throat> okay. And since oil is 50% of the energy at the time, and the main exporters are colonized, okay, so with oil backing, we have the petrodollar. So oil actually replaces, replaced gold. This was the first, uh, first reason why the price increased so much. Okay, now this is interesting for people to understand, to understand actually what the meaning of the petrodollar oil is. Between 1973 and 2016, the total U.S. trade deficit was $12 trillion, okay? <clears throat> Which, so, the U.S. had a trade deficit of $12 trillion, okay? So, it had demand for other currencies of the equivalent of $12 trillion, okay? So, this would weaken the dollar. But the other countries they had to pay for their oil imports in dollars. They had to pay, they had to get dollars to buy oil, okay? And then the need for oil was, during this period, okay, the imports of other countries was $32 trillion, okay? So actually, there was a greater demand for dollar, okay? Than there was dollar uh, demand for the other currencies by the U.S. due to the trade deficit, okay? Now, uh, and if these petrodollar monarchies, the, the petro monarchies recycle just 35%, as John Perkins explained, they have to recycle much more than 35%, okay? Confessions of an economic hitman. But just 35% finish, they don't even need to print uh, money to sustain the trade deficits, okay? Now we'll look here. This is not actually zero around uh, 2002, 2003. We'll see it. We'll zoom on it. So now you can understand when uh, Russia recently demanded that its energy be priced in rubles, okay, this removes a big chunk of energy from actually supporting the dollar or the euro, okay? Okay, now we uh, reduce the scale on the period. Even at its lowest point, it was still about 105%. So it was always more than enough to sustain the trade deficit, okay? That's other countries' need for dollar to buy oil was always, always greater than the U.S. trade deficit. So, it's, I feel too much like giving a lecture. Perhaps you want to discuss something or say something, you know. It's a, a no, no, boring. it's excellent. It's excellent. You are providing an invaluable service here for people to really see graphically really what was going on. And uh, 
No, this is a lecture, although I can tell you that we have about uh, 15 minutes left. But uh, other than that, it's, just, it's wonderful. People have to be educated on those issues with the showing them actual the graph representation, uh, graphic representation of what was going on. Uh, it's one thing to narrate it in words, totally mm -hmm. another when it is done as a lecture. Okay, sorry. Uh, anyhow, you can stop me anytime or find it boring. Or no, 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 no. You're good for another 15 minutes. Okay, so here, let's look at this. Uh, taking 1980 as reference, okay for price and volume okay the soviet union looking at the exports and uh, between 1980 and the fall of the soviet union okay <laughs> the the exports increased 75 percent at the blue line okay but the income of the soviet union dropped 60 percent okay the brown line you can see that. Hmm. And the same thing with Russia after the Maidan coup and when Russia took over Crimea. The same trick was played. Uh, as you can see, between 2014 and 16, Russia increased marginally its exports, about 10%, but the revenue dropped 50%. Instead of $0.6 trillion, it dropped to 0 0.3 trillion. So commodity exchanges, okay, these are neither producers nor consumers. They set the price. Huh? So these are actually weapons of economic destruction. And one trick point is this is the only thing they know, actually because they do not operate really in the real economic terms. They have this monetarist view. They count profits, which is, of course, important. But, of course, they never counted uh, for issues of warfare, apart from the politics in general and economic development of the countries in general, especially such countries as Russia. So... Okay, so the financial instruments, the invisible hand of the market, that, uh, Smith, I think, you think is to talk about the invisible hand of the market. So this market manipulation is not limited to oil, but extends to all commodities, especially strategic commodities, okay? Gas, precious metals in particular, gold and silver, currencies, sovereign debt and interest rates, okay? And uh, you, you have a whole tool set, okay, between the Fed, the IMF, the BIS, and the rating agencies etc i'll try and do this quickly okay the latin american debt crisis the tool was oil price the federal uh, reserve rate which we discussed the global banks and the imf the japanese for uh, i don't know for the baby boomers okay you remember how japan was an economic miracle in the 1970s and 80s okay and it was crashed with just one requirement issued by the bank of international settlements okay the basel accord and now known as basel accord one because other basel accords followed two and three and the asian financial crisis in the late 90s hedge funds and the credit etc <clears throat> So this structure created by uh, Bretton Woods, which includes the Fed, Federal Reserve, the IMF, the World Bank, the BIS, the World Trade Organization, the International Atomic uh, Energy Agency, SWIFT, uh, credit trading agencies, commodity exchanges, global banks. So all these are a tool set which is used actually uh, as a strategic weapon, okay? And uh, these, uh, they work in tandem and when necessary, only when necessary, later military force. But usually with this tool set, you can uh, destroy nations. So it's actually financial instruments are the invisible hand of colonialism, <laughs> not of the market. And that's when we talk about Bretton Woods system siphoning wealth from producers. Okay, we gave an example now on oil for uh, the Soviet Union and Russia. Okay, guys.
I think uh, it's enough. We cannot get into the ge geopolitics now, uh, Andre. Well, uh, it was excellent. And this is precisely, as they say, what doctor prescribed, so to speak. You know, this is precisely to give people an idea of the framework. Because um, while those you're correctly stating and absolutely brilliantly exposing the, uh, those instruments, as are colonial instruments essentially, and about siphoning of the productive, uh, basically, uh, forces from the developing world, of course, this is uh, completely different in terms of Russia. And this is where it, uh, my favorite shtick, so to speak, is uh, mentioning those famous 14 points by Jeffrey uh, uh, um, Barnett uh, in the uh, Parameters magazine in 1980 something three, where he described basically those tools, why, for example, West was leading the way. And out of those 14 items, which include the dominance in the aerospace industry, the dominance in the uh, 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 producing the finished products, the dominance in the communications, dominance in the uh, other things, you know, and with the exception, I believe, of those uh, 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 terms as the dominating financial system and uh, having exercising the, some moral authority at that time, which was, of course, the 80s and 90s, uh, basically 90 plus percent of those items have been related to the actual production, manufacturing of goods, manufacturing of things which actually provide for the development of the well, real economy and where they bring people to uh, basically real profits, real incomes, they can operate within the system, they can go out and buy some kind of things, you know, ranging from the food to whatever consumer goods. And I love to constantly point this out that in the end, doesn't matter, just to give you example, which uh, uh, because we will need to be wrapping up pretty much soon, but I was laughing always and I wrote about it and I actually made the video which describes it, Lloyd's, the insurance, okay, <laughs> London-based Lloyd's, okay. Here they are, and when you read what, uh, how they, you know, threaten those horrendous consequences to Russian economy by withdrawing audit companies, you know, British audit companies from Moscow, it's like good riddance, you know, just get the hell out of here. And they say, how are you going to insure your vessels? Oh, very simple. Russia is rich and powerful. We create our own insurance agency, and this is what Russia created exactly, and now insured this so-called shadow fleet of the tankers, which is 270 tankers, evidently, by different counts. Some people say it's 200, others. So what are you going to do about it? Ah, you're going to send the Royal Navy? To attack them, well, London will be turned into the parking lot in 20 minutes, you know. So this is what real economy, real industry, real, you know, things give you. They give you the mind. And now when we have the special military operations, those people don't understand. You talk to some moron from Wall Street and he comes up with this GDP like, oh, we have GDP too. First, you don't. All this is baloney, it's crap, I mean, all those numbers. That's why I think they don't understand that Russia, having two times smaller population uh, than the United States, produced almost 70% of America's in, uh, uh, um, energy, all, all of it, you know, in the equivalent uh, oil. And when you look at this, um, how can you communicate with those people? They're stupid. <laughs> so, and this is why uh, when I read your book, it was like, and of course, Michael Hudson was the guy who was basically chipping at it for since seventies. And then your book comes out and says, "Yeah, in practical geopolitical terms, it's unsustainable. You cannot constantly BS people into believing something." Yeah, it's. Uh, I I don't know. We, we can see now what is happening to Europe, and it's just it's over for Europeans. Actually, people say, "Oh, you don't like us." No, I like it. But the problem is this present Europe is unsustainable, for example. Andre, we, the example we gave, we showed the, how they were stealing from the USSR, I think it was 60%, and from Russia, mm -hmm. 50% by the manipulation. But this is not limited to... Uh, you saw how they were stealing uranium from nature. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, for ages. Most of that government... Yeah, they... the world, 
And then they live at the high standard, you know, we are developed, we are advanced, we are, you're a bunch of thieves, you know, you understand, and they use these sophisticated tools, when necessary, okay, we bomb, we kill, but usually with these tools, it's sufficient. <laughs> yeah. Well, Dr. Lama, what can I say? Uh, it was uh, today magnificent, and um, what can I say? We will have to continue, obviously, uh, and uh, this is just going to be the People love what you're saying, and uh, obviously the format is incredible. And now that we kind of have the, uh, some technical issues sorted out, what I want to say for today, thank you very much for being thank with you. us. Thank you, Andre. And we'll, I'll be in touch again. We're going to get it, you know, we'll do another round, so to speak, and more and more so because the book is crucial in understanding. Your book is crucial in understanding all of that. And I will, as usual, leave there uh, basically all uh, links to your book, to Amazon for people at Clarity Press for people to go out and buy it because it's a must read. So, well, thank, thank you. you for being with us today. And I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Thank you, Andre. Thank you.